Hi, I'm Daphna. And I'm Jess. And we are so excited to have you join us for the session on how to go in the field and help animals in your own backyard. You're going to learn how to assess dogs from tip of nose to tip of tail. How to identify and document cruelty. How to report cruelty to your local law enforcement authorities. And how to get chaining bands passed in your area. Let's go. When dressing to help animals in your community, you need to dress appropriately and look professional. We wear clothes that protect us from the weather, bugs, and excited dogs. We wear long pants, usually cargo pants, so that we can have plenty of treats in our pockets and waterproof work boots. I'm gonna go over the basic essentials of what you need to take with you. Both dry, and wet cat and dog food, nylon leashes and collars, a lightweight tie out to switch out heavy chains, clean food and water bowls, as well as a jug of water in case there's no water available on the property. We bring a rake to clean up any debris and trash, as well as feces. Inside our van, we have collapsible crates, but if you can't fit those into your vehicle, no big deal, just section off the back seat, but do always bring a cat carrier. We bring linens to put inside the crates as well as if we find an injured animal, they can be used as a stretcher. And never forget the toys and treats. When you're out in your community, either biking, driving, or out for a walk, always be aware of your surroundings. Dogs can be tucked away in backyards, so look for signs for dogs. Either the dog house, pins in the back, or even a beware of dog sign. So the first thing you have to do, of course, is get permission to go on the property and visit with the dog. You want to knock on the door, be very friendly and polite, keep a smile on your face, identify yourself by name and the name of your organization. Hi, I'm Daphna with PETA's Community Animal Project. Have you heard of our program? Here are the free services that we offer. We have a business card that has the word free on it, and we suggest you have some made for yourself as well, and we always have flyers ready with the different services that we offer. This is the one that we have about our free dog house straw bedding in winter. So if nobody is home, we want to make sure to leave a note so that they know we stop by and they give us a call back. This is Tinkerbell. We're here visiting Tinkerbell today and make sure she has fresh water and shade and uh, good food and a toy. Come here, Tinkerbell. Come here. She's a round little thing and she is absolutely filthy from all this digging in the dirt that she's been doing and she's doing that in order to keep cool. She's dug a couple of very deep holes here. Dogs do that in order to lie against the cool earth in the summer when it's very hot. Um, Tinkerbell is also filthy from the digging you can see my hands have turned totally brown from petting her for a few minutes and her collar is a little bit tight so we're going to loosen it or give it give her a new collar and check on her water which is murky brown and make sure that she is uh, as set as she can be for summer so we're going to replace Tinkerbell's water bucket today her water bucket contains not only disgusting water but it's also cracked so we're going to take it out do you want some fresh water and on our buckets, we put a sticker that says fresh water every day. We shouldn't have to do that, but we do do that to remind our clients how important it is. And hopefully it serves as a reminder that's effective. This is Tinkerbell's old water bucket. Not only does it contain disgusting, totally undrinkable water, but it's also cracked on the top here. And that's going to eventually cause some sharp edges. I also found these bones in her area. Um, and these can be very dangerous for dogs to chew on, so I'm cleaning the debris away to keep her safe. And we're gonna get rid of this water bucket. We just gave her a new one. Good girl.
this sweet little kitten was running around here and we just gave her a snack. She was totally ravenous and her body condition is very thin. Unfortunately, the man isn't home, but we are going to try to find him and see what we can do for this little girl and what kind of help he needs with her. So the first thing you have to do, of course, is to get permission to visit with the dog. We're here to visit a dog named Blackie, whom we've been visiting for some years. So I'm going to knock on the door and see if Miss Lillian will let us visit with Blackie today. Okay. Hi, Miss Lillian. How are you? I'm fine. Very good to see you. Well, I'm glad to see you too. Thank you. Is it okay with you if we visit with Blackie today? Oh, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. We're going to go back there and give him some love and some toys. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. You take care. Okay. Thank you too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Aww. He's such a good boy. Oh, buddy. Oh. I'm going to tell you seven pro tips on how to improve the lives of backyard dogs in your community. Number one, take photos and video. Documenting the conditions is very important, especially if the situation turns into a cruelty case. Number two, we're going to examine the condition of the dog. This is going to include the nose to tail exam, as well as the body condition score. We use the tough scale one to five, one being ideal and five being emaciated. Number three, we're gonna always check the collar. You put two fingers underneath the collar to make sure it's not too tight. Number four, we're gonna check the dog's confinement. Is If the dog's in a pen, we're gonna make sure there's no sharp edges or holes where they can injure themselves. Or if they're on a heavy chain, we're gonna switch it out for a lightweight tie out. Number five, we're gonna check the dog house. Does it have four walls, a roof, and is it elevated off the ground? If not, we're gonna get them something better. Looks good. Number six, we're gonna check the area. We're gonna clean up all of the debris and feces, as well as make sure that the dog has a good amount of shade available to them. Number seven, we're gonna give them food and water. We often arrive at properties where there's not drinkable water available to the dog. So we're gonna clean out the water bucket, give fresh water, and a bowl of food. So one of the most important things that we do in the field is really assess dogs from tip of nose to tip of tail. This is midnight. Like most of the dogs we visit, Midnight spends her entire life outside at the end of a tether. And as you can see, she's extremely excited for the friendship and company that she's getting today. Um, so we're going to look at her eyes, her ears, her mouth, and her coat. Our, her eyes are bright. There is no discharge, clear or otherwise. Her ears look clean and just fine. She's a very good cooperative friend. And we're going to look in her mouth. Her teeth are nice and white. And usually we just check to make sure that the gums are pink. And I've got a little bit of chow in her, so she's got very dark gums, but they look nice and healthy. She's an unremarkable weight. We use the Tufts body condition scoring system, which is from one to five, one being unremarkable or normal and five being emaciated. And she is an unremarkable body condition. One thing that is remarkable about Midnight is that she has some flea allergy dermatitis uh, on her rear end. And that just means that she's allergic to fleas. So one flea bite can drive her completely crazy um, with relentless itchiness. And we're gonna treat her for fleas today to try and give her some relief. But what happens is that dogs who are allergic to the flea saliva develop uh, very uh, large, large sores and spots of hair loss and it's extremely uncomfortable for them. It's uncomfortable for anybody, but if you're allergic, of course, it's even worse. So during the winter months, when it's cold and wet, we deliver free straw bedding to dogs who are relegated to the outdoors so that they are kept less cold and as dry as possible, thanks to the insulating straw. You never want to put blankets or towels or anything like that in a doghouse because they will get wet and freeze and make things a lot worse. But as the weather warms up, we are going around and taking all the straw out of the doghouses because the straw attracts fleas, ticks, and other insects. 
and it's also uncomfortable for the dogs to lie on it when the weather is hot. We have a very special avocado for you. What do you think? Come on. As you can see, a $3.99 toy can really change a dog's day. This dog is gonna enjoy this avocado until she destroys it, which may be in five minutes or maybe in a couple of days, but she certainly is getting a lot of joy out of it. And it's such a tiny investment. You can go to the dollar store and get cheaper toys, but you can get toys like this at Marshall's, TJ Maxx, those kinds of stores for just a couple bucks. And, you know, invest 20 bucks and get a, a few good toys and make some dogs really, really happy. So this is Boy Boy. Boy Boy is kept uh, out here tethered 24 seven. We just received permission from his owner by phone to visit with him. And his situation is sadly pretty typical of the dogs that we visit and the dogs that you may end up visiting in your community. The key is to be patient and persistent in order to continue to be able to help these dogs and be welcome on their owner's property. I just want to point out a few things about Boy Boy. He's wearing a, a choke chain that we're going to replace. He had this water bowl, which does have a little bit of water in it. He chose to swim in it before we arrived and he's all wet, but we're going to replace this bowl with a bucket um, so that he has a steadier source of water and that he doesn't knock it over which is what happens dogs when dogs with tethers keep circling around the bowl. We're going to give them a meal and we're going to pick up the debris. And one of the things you'll know with these dogs who are kept outdoors 24 seven relegated to the backyard is that they are often tethered amongst trash. And there's a trash pile right here to the left, which is um, really indicative of how the dogs are viewed, unfortunately, by their human families. So while it may be very difficult to keep your cool, it is absolutely vital to stay friendly and open and uh, polite with the owners because they don't have to welcome you onto their property, but as long as they welcome you onto their property, you can keep helping their dogs. And it may be that one day they decide to part with their dogs and you will be the first person they call. So stay patient, stay persistent for the sake of dogs like Boy Boy. Another essential that just talked about earlier is a 15 foot lightweight tie out with swivels at both ends that prevents the dogs from getting tangled. And it is lightweight and very often we find dogs who are tethered by extremely heavy chains that um, weigh their necks down and cause them a tremendous amount of pain and discomfort. And so we carry these in our vans. They're not expensive and you can order them online. And um, as you can see, Boy Boy has one of those and that is, uh, that replaced a very heavy chain. If you find a dog who is wearing a prong collar, pinch collar, or a choker collar, you wanna make sure to immediately replace those, of course, with the owner's permission. Those collars are extremely uncomfortable and cause the dog pain. And they are also dangerous and more likely to get embedded into the dog's neck and throat. Boy Boy here is wearing a choker collar and we've spoken to his owner by phone and we got his permission to replace that collar with a well-fitted nylon collar. We're going to do that now. Joker boy. Joker boy. Yay! Woo! Good man! So Boy Boy is ready for his meal. That is the last thing that we do when we tend to these dogs for two reasons. One is many of them get territorial and protective of their food because they're very hungry. They don't always have the nutrition that they need. And the other thing it does is that it distracts them when we're leaving and we don't want them to be sad. So I'm gonna put the food down and tell him, see you later.
So when dogs are kept isolated, whether it's at the end of a chain or trapped inside a pen, they very understandably grow fearful. They can even become aggressive. And you have to be careful and delicate when you approach them. So at, keep in mind that a dog who's at the end of a chain 24 seven and doesn't know socialization and doesn't get to run, exercise, spend time with a human can be very territorial and has a, a fight or flee instinct. So. If they don't flee from you, sometimes they'll fight. So just go slow. Uh, here we have Pancake. Pancake, I'm going to approach her. She's a bit fearful, but she might warm up. And so I'm just going to show you how to very delicately and carefully approach a dog who is not very well socialized or doesn't at least get to spend a lot of time with people. So I'm gonna let Pancake come to me. I'm on my knees, I'm turned away from her. Come here, little pancake. Come on, little scared one. I'm not making direct eye contact and I'm just letting her come up to me on her own terms. And then of course, what the, the first thing that you notice about her is that she's really filthy. This is a beautiful little white dog and look at the cloud of dust coming off of her body when I touch her. Now her fur is also very rough and bristly, like scotch bright a little bit. And she's just dusty. You're just a big pile of dust, little pancake. Yeah. This little dog is very, very frightened. Um, we're in the backyard of an individual who passed away and his daughter refuses to part with the dogs even though she doesn't live here. So she has automatic feeders and waterers and she has not yet let us pick up these dogs. and. This dog, okay, her nails are overgrown. That's honestly the least of her problems because she's just petrified. And um, her collar is very, very tight. And one of the things that you want to do when you go in the field, as I mentioned, is always try to get two fingers under the collar to make sure that the collar fits comfortably. A dog should never, ever be tethered by a, a choke chain or a prong collar, which are painful even when they're not trapped at the end of the tether with them. Uh, but imagine having something so tight around your neck that you cannot undo. So while I'm trying to make friends with this little one, we are going to try to switch out her collar so that she's more comfortable. Oh, oh, that must feel so good. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, it was extremely tight around her neck, which I, I dread what this must have felt like around her skin and her throat. But you can see how much goo and grossness and filth this poor dog had the collar this tight around her neck. And luckily she's not wounded and it wasn't embedded, but I'm sure it was source of tremendous discomfort for her. So I'm glad we were able to approach her and get it off of her neck. We replaced it with a better fitting collar. We're really trying to get these dogs out of here. So one of the most important services that you can provide is helping people with spaying and neutering and not just spaying and neutering for low cost or for free at a low cost clinic, but also offering to take their animals to and from the clinic for free. That's one of the services that we provide through our program. And we help Joyce here out with her animals. Sure did. And I've been involved with Peter. They have been coming out here for the last nine years. They take very good care of my pets. They took them and had them all spaded. They took them to their hospital. They brought them back. They gave me the medicine with them for me to make sure that they take their medicine so they don't get no type of infection. Every so often, every few months, they come by, they check on them, they give them their flea uh, medication, they worm them, everything that needs to be done with the pet, 
Peter does it. Get in contact with Peter, and they the best people that you can deal with as far as your pets. I love them. I look forward to seeing them just as well as all as my pets. Oh, we love you too, Joy. <laughs> that's true. I, well, I'm sure it is. Yeah, that's true. It's very sweet. Thank yep. you. And would you have been able to get your animals? I wouldn't have been able to get now one of them spaded because I couldn't afford it. All of them would be walking around here with the children running behind them. And then I'm running behind them. Then the neighborhood calling me, wanting to know where all these cats and dogs coming from. So it made me peaceful. Good. Kept me at peace. Good. And one of the most important things, too, is that spaying and neutering prevents animals from getting uterine cancer, testicular cancer, and other reproductive organ cancer. And of course, as Joyce says, the most important thing is that it combats the overpopulation crisis and prevents the births of unwanted litters. We are already struggling with a huge homelessness crisis in the United States. We use two different products to help keep the flies off of the dogs outside. We use the Bronco fly spray, which we put on our hands and then wipe them down with it. This helps keep the flies off of them and from biting them. As well as the flies off ointment. This is when you see the flies eating at their ears. You want to put this on their ears. Oh, Daisy's so good at this. And this will keep the flies from biting at their ears. Another really important service that you can provide that will help people out in the community is to give away free food. Much of the free food PETA gets and gives out is collected from local animal shelters who get donations that they can't use for their own shelter animals. And we also get donated bags of dog food from the wonderful company V-Dog. I mean, it's, it's, it, y'all just is a godsend. You, it's really a godsend. And I would tell him, and you know, when y'all come out here, it might not be you, it might be one of the others. But I always, when I know somebody else have a pet that's not being taken care of, and I know they can't afford to take care of them like they do, I always send Peter. Thank always you, send Joyce. Peter. I really do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How okay, Miss Dorothy. How are you today? Fine. You? Good. Thank you. Would it be okay with you if we visit Spot? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We wanted to give him a little nail trim and put some flea medicine on him. Okay. Good. Well, thank you so much. Okay. You are welcome. So one of the things that we do on our visits is make sure that the dogs don't have overgrown nails. It's extremely uncomfortable and it can get very dangerous. Sometimes the nails can grow back into their pad. So Spot here needs a little nail trim. We just gave him some flea medicine because he has some flea allergy dermatitis, which you can see here on his rear end. And we will see if he's feeling cooperative this afternoon. He's a very, very sweet guy. Are you going to let me hold you for a nail trim? Okay, here we go. What a good man. That would be so much more comfortable. Wow, he is a good boy. This is one patient gentleman you have here. Very patient. Good boy. You good chunky monkey. Good boy. Yeah. So this is Lexus. Um, we drove by Lexus's home here and noticed that her water bucket was knocked over and so we stopped and then we noticed that Lexus is also underweight. She's acting a bit lethargic. Um, and her gums are very, very pale, which is a sign that she's anemic. So we've tried to reach the owner. No one is home at the moment, and we just spoke with her mother. At some point, uh, you may encounter situations that require you to either remedy a situation by working with the owner or calling law enforcement authorities. When you call law enforcement authorities, you want to be sure that you have documentation photos and video. We've taken lots of photos and video of Lexus's condition, the fact that her water was knocked over, 
the fact that she drank water for minutes after we offered it to her, and she also happens to be ravenous. We're going to try to work with the owner and see if she will allow us to take Lexus. Um, but if she doesn't, it's possible that we will have to alert law enforcement. If you're in this position, what you want to be sure to do is take very careful notes of what you've seen, uh, all of the documentation and records of you speaking with the owner, your attempts to reach the owner, all the photos and video of the dog's body condition, any notes that you left on the door when you tried to reach the person, and so on. And um, it's very important when you report things to local authorities that you follow up with them. Unfortunately, in our experience, not every agency is eager to do its job, and that is why it is important for you to do your job and hold them accountable and give them all of the information that they need. Your eyewitness account in detailed notes, your photos and your video, uh, and if the owner allows you to take the dog to the vet, detailed vet records, not just the receipt, but the veterinarian's detailed notes. So, great news. Lexus was given to us today, so we don't have to worry about her wasting away at the end of her tether with a low red blood cell count and suffering um, without food and water. So now you know how to help individual dogs in the field. And for the dogs you visit, you will make a world of difference. You may even make a difference of life or death for them. But what about the big picture? It should be illegal to keep dogs tethered or penned outdoors. We want to help you pass legislation like we have in the cities surrounding our headquarters and in our state of Virginia, restricting tethering in certain weather conditions and banning unattended tethering in some towns and cities. You can do the same, and we are here to help. Your first step, if you haven't already, is to study the existing laws in your city, county, and state about tethering and standards of care for animals. You can easily find these laws on your state legislative website, your city or county site, or on a site called municode.com. Get your local animal control support, if at all possible. Meet with them in person, thank them for their hard work, and get them on board. Rally community support, too, for a ban on unattended tethering. Elected officials are much more likely to pay attention if they know that constituents are concerned about an issue. So garner support with petitions and get local businesses involved. Ask around wherever you shop and encourage your friends, family, and neighbors to do the same. Everyone knows someone who knows someone, so by asking around, you may connect with someone influential in the community who will lend support to this important cause. Finally, contact your local officials by phone, email, or letter. Ask them to meet in person. Always be polite and professional and come armed with facts about how dogs suffer when chained and why chaining dogs makes them more likely to bite. Use local cases as examples of why laws need to be changed. Thank you for joining us today. Please don't forget to stream Breaking the Chain, the documentary about our fieldwork that's available for free on Prime Video. And most importantly, never give up. Even if a situation seems hopeless, one person can truly change the life for a lonely, neglected backyard dog. Patience and persistence are key. Thank you on behalf of all of the dogs you will be helping. We are anxious to hear about all your successes and never hesitate to give us a call if we can be of help.